in the bill. Give it up for that. I'm 
future, there'll be a sociological paper written about how people choose their seats on stages like this. Um, I'd already drink in the water. So oh, there you go. I'm just Perfect. Everybody else. <laughs> so germ dispersion. Uh, all right, let's start with just a very simple question that I'm sure you all could get very deep into. What did your time with Commodore mean to you and to your life? I was just a kid who was lucky to be in a cool place building cool stuff. And frankly, I thank my lucky stars that I had the opportunity to meet some of these people and work with them. I can't claim to be a visionary, uh, but it was a great time. We were all a bunch of unsupervised kids <laughs> building stuff we wanted to have. So I'm the odd man out. I actually never worked for Commodore. I left Amiga like about a month before uh, Commodore purchased them. But I'm here to represent the Amiga team, the great Amiga team, and all the uh, creative stuff they did, hardware and software. Kind of hard for me to separate out what Commodore meant to my life, because for a long time that's all it was. Uh, it's certainly and. In a very real way, it was the family business, so uh, hard to really define it that way. Um, it was the best time of my life. You just can't say more than that. It was, as, as Headley said, or we're playing with exactly what we want to do. We had a chip fab below us and the unicorns in the hallway, and <laughs> you know, it, it just wasn't any better than that. And uh, cashing a paycheck was just kind of something added to it. They paid us. <laughs> All right. We also, for questions, of you out there in the audience who have questions, we do have a microphone, and we have someone there right now. Howdy. Um, my name is John Swan, and um, I was around in college when the Commodore Pet came out, and me and my brother, he, we were all at Illinois Institute of Technology, south suburbs of Chicago, and I remember we took the day to drive to Ann Arbor, Michigan to pick up that Commodore pet because it was the only one in the upper Midwest. <laughs> um, and, but for me, the Amiga 1000 was my first uh, computer. I'm just wondering, um, I noticed that uh, Chuck Peddle was mentioned a few times in the movies. By any chance, Chuck here tonight? I think if Chuck was here, we know it by yeah, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. so um, I was just wondering, what was kind of like the, the best time that you had uh, in, in design? Any of you, the, 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 you know, the best thing that you had designed in, in uh, your experience? Well, uh, I worked with several great engineering teams, and the Amiga team was just a, a wonderful and creative group of engineers. Uh, and uh, I think that just working with them was the, the big experience. Yeah, our group was called the Animals. Um, we had long hair, we made holes in the wall, as you saw. Uh, we didn't dance as much, I don't think, as some of the other people. Uh, but you get to start with a piece of paper, at least back then, and lay down a design, and then you spend the rest of a year making all the little numbers add up. And that's fun, too. So you get to do the whole thing, and in a compressed point period of time. And then afterwards, taking a shower was pretty cool. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, quick question. I bought the Commodore Pet and took it into HP because it had the IEEE 488 bus. Why did it have the IEEE 488 bus in a little game computer? Well, it, it wasn't designed to be a game computer. It was designed to be a personal computer. Um, and that was basically the only bus that was a standard at the time. Uh, so there wasn't a lot to choose from, and Chuck wanted it to be compatible with at least something out there. Uh, in fact, there were some very, very strange things that happened towards the end of the development cycle. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the uh, IEEE 48 bus worked. So we wound up renting some incredibly expensive equipment uh, that used the bus. Um, to uh, to make sure everything worked on it, and so we had this little, you know, five hundred dollar computer running this ten thousand dollar piece of equipment. 
Yes, and that's what I did with it at HP, and it did work. I was really impressed. It, it did work, right? Good. Yeah. We hadn't yet invented the serial bus, which meant we hadn't ruined the serial bus yet. <laughs> All right. Anyone with, else with a question? Oh, here we go. Charging head first towards the, the mic. Yeah. I remember when uh, Commodore and Amiga went out of business in the early 90s, and it seemed like the replacement, the, uh, the IBM 386 at the time, was so much less capable and more boring than what you guys were doing. It seemed like we were going into a, a dark age for a while. It was it seemed like a classic case of uh, worse is better, where the, the worst technology was, was winning out. And I just wonder if you had any perspective on what that felt like from the inside or uh, you know, what we can do in the future to try and keep the, uh, the quality, technology, and capabilities kind of at the forefront, uh, winning uh, the, on the business side as well as the, the technology side. Well, the way to make sure that doesn't happen is to convince everyone um, to get a really good technical education uh, so that they know the good stuff to buy. <laughs> Which may be difficult. <laughs> Uh, one of the goals of the Amiga team was to design a computer that wouldn't just sell to uh, gamers or business people, but that would sell to artists. That's why we put so much effort into the, the graphics and the audio music capability. And the fact that it's inspiring uh, people who aren't uh, just computer nerds, but actually artists and creators, I think is very important. And, and I think those people, as they get involved, will, will uh, encourage more machines, more software that, uh, that uh, creates more of a creative instinct rather than, uh, what did you call them, business machines, which are important also. Hi, I had a question for Leonard. Uh, in the movie, you mentioned, or you described the history of Commodore buying Moss which designed the 6502 CPU that was in millions and millions of devices. I was wondering if you could speak um, as to, you know, was that a really significant uh, revenue source for Commodore at the time? And how, was, how did the financials work out with uh, it being in so many devices? Was that a big boon for, for Commodore? No. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, why, why not? Yeah, the, um, the one of the things that Chuck insisted on, uh, if this was going to be a real microprocessor, it should be um, second sourced by uh, other semiconductor manufacturers. Uh, so virtually all of the 6502s that went into other uh, companies' machines were made by other companies, not by Commodore. Yeah, it was uh, Rockwell, CenterTech had done the licensing on those. Uh, the thing that chips did for us, though, was we had our own silicon. Nobody else, I, I suppose you could say TI or, or whatever, but I've, I've been accused of saying Apple just used our chips, right? But, but we could design what we wanted a chip to do and the guy in the next row over would make it happen. So it was the facilitating thing for us. We weren't just putting chips together, we were doing whatever we needed to do. And was, in fairness, it sometimes it got sloppy. Uh -huh. It was like, oh yeah, we can find a Gatorade, we'll have it back in two weeks. Ah, screwed that up, let's find another Gatorade. And they would just spit them out like that, like they were boards. Yeah, we used to save a half lot. I would order where I'd say, okay, you only give me half the chips and save half of the lot, only half made. So if we made a mistake, or the chip designer made a mistake, they could go in and change the four, five, and six layers and still get something out of the thing. So we were always like playing with, you know, moving pieces on the board all with an eye towards CES. Because you can't move CES by an hour or a day. <laughs> so one of the things I really enjoyed about the Commodore 64 is everybody built stuff for it. There were so many of them, there were lots of third parties building things for it. For me, the fast load cartridge saved my life. It saved many, many hours of my life. I was wondering, what sort what surprising things you see that third parties did with the products that wow I didn't expect that. Anybody? Well, I, I carried a fast load cartridge in my pocket so much that I got one of those wallet marks on my jeans. <laughs> Only it's from uh, Mach 5. 
And I, I used it for a fast load, but it also put a C128 directly in the 64 mode. So that, that was one of my favorite ones. We had our favorite games. Jumpman was one of them. Um, when I wanted to feel less pressure than working a Commodore, I'd play Kennedy Approach. You know, you, you hear, you hear them radio in telling you they, they're flying into the mountains, and in your mind you could hear them screaming and calling your name. And you come walking out of your office ready to go back to work, you know, because suddenly working a Commodore didn't seem so bad. <laughs> if, if anybody knows the uh, game Mind, oh, what was it called? Mind Walker? The Amiga? Oh, that, we had that music playing in every office. <laughs> you just walk around pretty soon, you're, you're, you know, you're slobbering and stuff. It just kind of deadens the brain. But it was cool. We played our own games. That never actually happened. happened. What's that? I, I think that was in your head. <laughs> <laughs> it, you're going to tell me my pet mouse was in my head, too? <laughs> Headley tried to kill my mouse one day. I, I had taken a pair. Of, I had a pair of shoes that once I took them off, I wouldn't put them on again. Um, I think I wore them like ten days without taking them off. Kicked them into the corner of my office. Then I had to cover them up because they were keeping me awake. A mouse had chewed in through the toe and, and made a home in my shoes. And I would feed it little Doritos and stuff. I, I had an air mattress that I would sleep in at night, and people knew if they disturbed me, there better be a good reason. Well, one night, Headley is leading a crew, he probably doesn't remember this or thinks I'm making it up. I'm damn sure you're making it up. Yeah. <laughs> they had seen the mouse down the hallway. They said it ran down the hall, turned left, and was running into my office. So I wake up with three or four people trying to kill my mouse. So it's like I had to stand up and protect my mouse and be a little Dorito. <laughs> you don't remember that, do you? <laughs> Welcome to Silicon Valley corporate culture. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you asked about the the strangest things that people had used these machines for. So um, after uh, I finished graduate school, my wife and I went to Europe for our, our honeymoon. And one of the places we stopped in at uh, in just outside of Geneva, um, everyone's heard of it now, CERN, the uh, European Center for Nuclear Research. Um, we were going on the tour and we walked by the control board for one of the large experiments at the time. It's a large European bubble chamber, and at the center of it was a Commodore PET, <laughs> which just stunned me. <laughs> All right, next question. That'll, this will be the last question from the board, and then I get one. Okay, no pressure. I'll try to have a good question. So, uh, I grew up in a militantly Commodore and Amiga only household, and, and I'm still the same way, uh, you know, all this time later. Um, and for, for me, growing up, it's like everyone had a 64, it seemed. Um, I grew up with a 128, which I actually have, Bill. I'd love to have your John Hancock on it, if that's okay with you. Um, I brought it with me today. But, um, why did that success not go on to like the Amiga 500? That was a natural successor. It was the same kind of you know wedge, all-in-one device. At least in the U.S., why couldn't we translate that? I say we, but I'm part of the Commodore family. I feel like so why couldn't Commodore and Amiga have that same success in the States with the 500? What went wrong there, in, in your estimation? I have no idea. <laughs> but one thing I noticed. I knew no one in California who had an Amiga. I put my Amiga in storage because I figured no one was using it. 30 years later, I go to Europe and I find tons of people from Northern Europe that the Amiga was their first computer, was the computer that inspired them to become uh, graphic artists or programmers or whatever. So I think the experience was different in Europe than it was in the US. This ties back to the earlier question about how we prevent these bad things from happening, losing the superior technology. And it's heresy in Silicon Valley or in some places, but the bottom line is marketing, baby. The European group marketed the heck out of that thing. The U.S. group thought Commodore C64 sold themselves. After I left, I didn't see a single Commodore commercial for like the first three years. And, and I, I defy you to, well, I wouldn't defy you, but I'd say, did anybody see a commercial during that time? And uh, I didn't. I, I actually saw one of the commercials and it was really bad. <laughs> was, was it the one with the, uh, the embryo? 
Yeah, all right, I'll tell a quick story. They, we did do one commercial because they posted the pictures of it inside Commodore because uh, we got a hold of it. And it was supposed to be the dawn of a new age. And we knew what it was supposed to be and we still didn't understand the, it was like an old man walking down the hall and stuff. And then there's an embryo and stuff. Well, they had a picture of shooting that. And basically it was, we called it fetus on a stick. <laughs> and it was like somebody holding the thing, rotating it for the camera shot. And it's like, that's our message? <laughs> Thanks for that in yep. <laughs> That's my marketing, baby. I, I actually think we're going to have to end on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for all our great guests. Good to see you. 